Okay, we're going to have our first lecture on fingerprints, so you definitely want to take um, lecture notes in your spiral. And you need to be patient with me, I'm working with a new tablet, so I'll be fumbling around a little bit. So let's pull up all the information for the basic principles. Now, when we're looking at fingerprints, you really need to look at, if available, um, all 10 prints. Because even your own fingerprints, there are different ridges and characteristics. So your thumbprint is not exactly as your index finger or your ring finger. So everyone's a little bit different. And really, I'm sure you've heard of this before, that no two individuals have the exact same finger pattern. Um, so that's what... Um, in law and criminalists, they tend to use the fingerprints. It's been around for years, so they still hold to that. And for an individual, whatever you're born with, those fingerprints or those patterns remain unchanged for the rest of the life. Now, of course, if you have any scars um, or any kind of skin disease, that would change the pattern. But really, that would even give it more characteristic to an individual print. So sometimes um, criminals will often try to file away their fingerprints, especially a broker or something like that, so they don't leave any prints behind. But lots of times that actually helps identify the criminal. So we're going to be looking at ridge patterns. Uh, we'll kind of divide them into three main categories. So let's go ahead and take a look at some um, other information here. Okay, so ridgeology, that is a study of the different ridge patterns, and that's why we're able to grasp things because it actually provides friction. So when we're talking about ridges, we're actually looking at all of these lines. So this would be if we have black ink and we make a print. So the black lines are the ridges and the white portions are called the valleys. So when we look at the ridge patterns, um, on average, each fingerprint will have what they refer to as points. So these are 150 points. So if you see these red dots, and we'll get into these ridge patterns in just a second, but you can see here's a point. So this would be like a fork, okay, very characteristic. Here's another fork. So all of these red dots are points. So on any one fingerprint, you could have up to 150 different points. Now, that doesn't mean that a criminologist will have to identify all of them. We'll get into the numbers here in just a second. And here's a little fun fact. Besides primates, the only other mammal, um, one is the koala. So they have fingerprints similar to humans. Um, of course, we know that primates would. But really, between different koalas, they can even be different. So you can identify a koala based on its fingerprint. Okay, so when we're looking at Fingerprint identification, we're looking at the ridges. Um, now, I talked about on the points. So really, to be a similar or a close to a match, you need to be careful with the word match. Um, United Kingdom, they require a minimum of 16 points to be similar or be close to a match, whereas in the United States, the FBI, and Australia, uh, a minimum of 12. So the more you have, the better. 20 is exceptional. Um, remember, there's available of 150 on each print. Now, you may have heard this if you watch CSI a lot. It's called APHIS. And so law enforcement will run through a database just for fingerprints. We're going to be looking at other databases for other uh, trace evidence. But really, these are fingerprints of deceased and suspects already in the system. And to date, there are about 55 million prints of deceased and suspects on file. So when a law official sends in a print to APHIS into the database, the database will provide 10 to 12 possible matches. And then from there, they would use other trace evidence to help identify uh, the particular suspect or if it's a victim. Okay, so let's get into the classification. So really we're going to, anytime you start with an unknown print, you want to start, and I've got a handout too that'll run you through these step-by-steps, um, but at least get the basics into your spiral and then you can print off the other sheet when we actually do the lab. So we're going to be looking at patterns, these ridges and valleys, and we're really going to focus on the ridges. So there's three main classification. There's the arch, the loop, and the whirl. So each individual, 
each print could have any variation of that. So when you look at each major category or class, underneath that, they're actually broken down into like subclasses or subcategories. So for arch, you can have plain or tinted, and we'll show you examples of this and how you identify those. Loop, radial, and ulnar. So if you've had anatomy, that looks familiar. And then for the whorl, uh, there are three main, that's the plain, central pocket, and double loop. And then the accidental, anything that really doesn't fit into any other categories is kind of dropped into the accidental. Okay, now here's a little fun fact. And this will also help you to narrow it down. Um, always start with the loops, because that's the most or the highest percentage of the population. And then arches is only about 5%. So if you have an arch, which you think is an arch, you may want well to look for the ridge patterns, characteristics, and just to make sure it's not actually a loop. So kind of start with that. Knowing the history, or not the history, but the um, statistics for each will help you identify it. Now, um, just kind of a little basic here on terminology. Uh, dactyloscopy is a study of fingerprints. So anytime you see dactyl, we're dealing with the finger. Um, sorry, those are my dogs barking. So police investigators who, <laughs> sorry about that, who specialize in the prints, they look at dactylograms. Those are the fingerprints. And so if they study dactyloscopy, then that's identification of the prints. Okay, so let's start with loops, which is the most popular type of print, or most commonly found. Okay, I mentioned there's ulnar and radial. Now the ulnar is referring to the bone in your arm. So the ulnar, the ulna, is on the pinky side. So it's really important to know, are we looking at the left or the right hand? Because that will dictate, is it gonna be the ulnar or the radial? Now this is the only one where you need to know the bones for the loops. So I'm not sure if you can see it. Let me grab a pen here. Okay, so if I'm looking at the definition of a loop is the open end of the loop. So here is the loops, okay? The open end is pointing toward whatever bone it is. So if I'm on the right hand, so if you need to hold your right hand out and then look at the loop, if it's point, the open end of the loop, if it's pointing toward the little finger, then that's an ulnar loop. The other thing it looks at is something called a delta, and this is a ridge characteristic. And a delta is basically a triangle. That's why you have in your shoulder the deltoid muscle. Okay, so right here is a delta, and so it's going to open up away from the delta. Here's a radial loop, so here's the loop. Here's the open end, again, the right thumb, and here's the delta, so the open end is away from the delta. Now, I'm not going to read everything on every single slide. I'm just going to hit the high points, and you can pause it to read everything or if you need to write stuff down. Okay, so that was a loop. Now, let's go to the whorl. Whorl means kind of a circular pattern, okay? So that's a whorl. So if I have two types, I have a plane and I have a central pocket. And the distinguishing fact on this between the two, they look a lot alike, kind of a spiral, is determining the deltas. Okay, so you need to find the deltas. If you think, okay, that's a whorl. Now let me find a delta. So we've got a delta here, okay, and we have a delta right down here. Okay, so the deltas, if I draw a line between the two, and here's a delta over here, okay. Um, so let's see, let me find this one here and right here. Sometimes they're not on the sides. So the line between the deltas, if it is touching or going through the bottom curve of the whorl, okay, like right here, it even goes down to here. So touching or through, then it's a plane. If it's not touching, it's a central pocket. So I need to find where it curves. So I need to locate the deltas, find the curve and draw a line between the two. So sometimes a straight edge would help on that. Okay, now keep going here. Now, this one is very easy to spot. Um, let me pull up the other slide here. So we've got the double loop whorl, and it's very easy to spot. It always makes an S, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the right direction. 
anytime it makes that S pattern, that's a double loop. So the double loop comes from here and here. So there's the looping pattern. Now, this one doesn't really fit into either one. I kind of have, um, if I look over here to the actual print, I kind of have a whirl. Um, here's a delta down here, and here's a delta. Um, but the center is not a circular pattern. So it doesn't really fit into any of the other. So they put it as an accidental world, kind of a combination of different things. Okay, and then the least common type of print is the arch. And this is the simplest type. And really we're gonna look at, you notice the arrows? So the arrows, if I start my arch, and it's kind of like a gradual hill. So if it starts on one side of the print and exits the other, that's gonna make it an arch. And then depending if it's a plane or tinted, the plane is kind of a gradual, kind of a bump. And then if I was to squish that together, okay, then it would tent up. Okay, so a spike or a tent, so called the tented arch. Okay, now here are the ridge characteristics. I'm not gonna give you any test question or quiz question about all the different ridge patterns but you do need to know what you're looking for when you're identifying a print. And in one of our labs, it will ask you on some of these very basics. Now, this is the most common um, that they'll refer to is the fork or the bifurcation. Okay, so there's the fork right there. The other one we've talked about is the delta. Okay, so I can even connect these and that would make, oops, make a delta. Um, and then kind of, you'll notice in prints too, you'll have the end of a ridge or a short little ridge. So those are the most common that you'll find. So the more points you can find in a fingerprint, the more similar to the characteristics are. So here are just a few, um, let me point out. So here's the fork. So if I was to draw this line, here's the fork right here, okay? Here's a ridge ending. So you notice I've got ridge patterns on both sides and then it stops right here. Here's a delta, if I was to connect that. A pour is you have this ridge and then there's an opening on the inside. Okay, so those are just example. Um, now obviously telling a pour from a core gets a little more tricky, So, but we're not gonna focus. Now, when we're gonna make prints of your actual fingerprints in class, um, it's really important to avoid partial prints because remember all the characteristics we have to look at? So we really wanna get a good print. And so there's a technique that we're gonna practice. You wanna really get the top and from edge to edge, especially if we have to look and see if it, um, like a tent, tinted arch, if it's going in one side and out the other. If we cut that off, we won't know. So how to make a good print. First, we need to do a roll and it's always left to right. And usually you start with your thumb. You don't have to push down that hard. Uh, the ridges will pick up any ink that you may have. Remember, if you just touch something, you leave your fingerprint behind. And then you're gonna, on the paper, do the same technique. You're gonna go left to right. And then you just continue all prints. Like I said, we're gonna work on this in class. And then of course, you'll use your notes and any magnifying glass so that you can see the different ridge patterns to help identify the print. Now, there is something called latent prints. And that is anything that's left behind that you really can't see. So it can be on glass, doors, paper. And so every type of print that's left behind at a crime scene, we'll say a crime scene, um, you have to collect it a certain way. So what we're gonna be doing in class is we're gonna be using powders. And we're just gonna do two different powders, real basic to understand the technique. So we're gonna look at a black powder and a white powder, okay? So, and then the other thing we're gonna use, we'll have a special brush the powder, and then we need something to lift the print off of the object, and we're just gonna use basic scotch tape. They have an actual lifting tape, um, but we're not gonna go into that. So our brush looks a lot like this. You may even see a brush that's characteristic of this. Now this is a camel hair brush, actual camel hair um, is the most common, and in the video, I think that's what they use. But the one we have is made out of fiberglass, okay? Now, one important thing, and I'll reiterate this um, in class, is that you don't wanna mix brushes up with powders, uh, big no-no. Okay, now here's some other powders. 
Um, anything that's on a really dark surface, sometimes they'll use a fluorescent, forensic powder, fluorescent, I can't talk, fluorescent powder. There we go. Sorry. I got forensics on my mind. And then you have to use a UV light. Okay. So you'll notice depending on the powder, um, it'll glow a different color. Okay. So that would be like on a dark surface. Okay. And then, um, magnetic powder. This one's kind of neat. This is an actual tool. It's not an actual brush. And there's a magnet on the end. And so what they'll do is they'll kind of activate the magnet, pick up the powder. So all of this on the bottom is the powder. And then they'll dust it over the print. And then it will pick up anything on a shiny surface or if you have a bag, a plastic bag, because obviously you don't want to put scotch tape on a plastic bag, you won't get the print off. So in some cases, you need a magnetic powder. And then whatever's left over on the powder, um, if they have some left on the magnet, they can just deactivate the magnet over the top of the jar and it'll release it. Okay, now this is, you may have heard the super glue method. Um, it's a fuming technique and it's a cyanoacrylic type of fuming and it's just super glue. And what they'll do is it will glow white. So they put it, they discovered it in the 80s and they actually take the print, put it in a chamber and then they'll put the super glue, heat it up, and then those fumes will attach to the print or the object, and it's reacting with the amino acids that's left behind in your fingerprint. Kind of interesting. Then hydrin, uh, another chemical that's going to react with the amino acids, and this one will, depending on the surface, will make uh, blue or purple prints. Okay, and then they'll lift that off of the object. Now, when we actually do the prints. Uh, and I'll have this in class for you all, so I just want to go over it one time. Very important that it, you have a light touch, and you don't need a lot of powder, okay? So you're just barely going to touch the tip, so you don't jam it into the powder. And then you're going to tap off the extra. So you just need a very, very, very small amount, okay? And then there's actually a couple of different techniques. Um, and you, even though it says hold the brush over it, I said that so you're not pushing it down into the print, because if you push the bristles into the print, then it could smudge it. And obviously you won't be able to have a good identification of the print. So it's basically over the top of it and it's a rolling technique, okay, between the fingers. And you just lightly touch it and kind of lift. If you watch that video for the pre-lab, um, she shows you the technique, okay? And she's actually using one of the uh, fiberglass brushes that we're going to use, okay? So very light touch. There's also kind of a brushing technique, but that's kind of hard to get into if you have a whirl print, which you don't know if you have that or not. Okay, then you take your piece of uh, lifting uh, tape, which we're just gonna use scotch tape, and you lift it off the object. Okay, and then I already talked about don't cross contaminate. Now, this is very important. These powders are very difficult to get cleaned up off of any object. So use very small amount, and then make sure you clean up anything um, before you move on to something else. Okay, so hopefully that's just a quick overview, and we'll do the activity in class um, just to make sure that you're clear, and we'll go from there. Okay, so I will talk to you later. Bye.